Today, I'm gonna to tell you about my favorite theorem, the ham sandwich theorem. This is a ham sandwich. Okay, it's a kind of sad ham sandwich, but it's all I've got right now. A ham sandwich has three components, two pieces of bread and a piece of ham, and last time I checked, we're living in three dimensions, which is gonna be important for our theorem. Then the claim of the ham sandwich theorem is that I can pick up my knife and there is some way that I could cut this ham sandwich so that all three components, the two pieces of bread and the piece of ham, can be cut exactly in half. What I really mean by a knife cut is that there exists a plane where if I sweep my knife along that plane, it cuts each object exactly in half. This is straightforward when the objects are spheres. I animated this by just plotting the plane that goes through the center of each sphere. But what is really remarkable is that this is true for any shapes with any orientation in three-dimensional space. Now, before I prove the ham sandwich theorem, I'm actually gonna begin by proving the pancake theorem because a pancake is thin enough that we're going to approximate it as just a two-dimensional object. If I move my knife in parallel, at one point there is less than half on the left side and at another there is more than half on the left side. So there must exist one of those parallel cuts where it is exactly equal. I might have to eyeball a bit to approximate exactly where the cut should be, but I know that it must exist. In mathematics, we call this the intermediate value theorem, a standard theorem in first year calculus. And the idea is that if I start with a continuous function that goes between two points, at A there's a height f of A and at B there's a height f of B, then for any intermediate value, any value between f of A and f of B, it's an existence theorem. It says there exists some point C in that interval AB such that F of C is that intermediate height. This is the same theorem that proves that I was once exactly four feet tall because when I was born, I was less than four feet tall. Today, I am more than four feet tall. I thus must have been exactly four feet tall at some point in time. Now I'm going to upgrade to two different pancakes thought of as two-dimensional objects. To show this, I'm gonna start by fixing some angles, say 45 degrees. We already argued it was easy to cut one pancake exactly in half, so let's focus on the red one. And keeping that angle of 45 degrees fixed, I can always slide my line until it intersects the red one and cuts that one exactly in half. That's great for the red one, but it's quite unlikely that that exact line is gonna cut the blue one exactly in half as well, and indeed in this case, it does not. However, if I start rotating that angle around, making sure to always slide my line so it's cutting the red one exactly in half, I can basically repeat that intermediate value argument again for the blue pancake. If I choose a specific side of my line, say underneath, then I can always talk about the proportion of the blue pancake that's underneath the line. Sometimes that's less than half, sometimes that is more than half of the pancake, and thus there must be some angle where it cuts the blue one exactly in half as well. So the pancake theorem says that for any two objects, there's always one line that you can cut exactly in half. And really, the pancake theorem is just proven as an application of the intermediate value theorem. Again, easy to visualize in this case where my two objects are circles and lines through the midpoints are always gonna cut them in half, but the real magic is that the exact same argument works no matter what weird shape or orientation my objects are in. Now, the three-dimensional case is gonna take a little bit more than just the intermediate value theorem to prove. So I want to tell you about another really fun theorem in topology called the borchuk ulam theorem. I want you to consider the surface of the Earth and for now, I'm gonna specifically go around the equator. The red and blue points that I've identified here are called antipodes. Antipodes are points on the exact opposite sides of the Earth. Then I wanna consider a function that takes any place around this equator and figures out what is its temperature at that location. We call just a circle in mathematics often S1, so this is a function from S1 to the real numbers. And it looks a little bit like this. As my point and its antipode move around the equator, I can plot what the temperature is at the blue point and at the red point. They might go up, they might go down, it depends on the climate, it depends on the season, but it looks something like these kind of graphs. But my claim is, this must cross at some spot. There must be some location where the temperature at the red point and the temperature at its antipode, the blue point, is exactly the same. This is actually just intermediate value theorem once again. If you're saying 
the temperature at one point is initially less than the temperature to add its antipode after you go all the way around the circle it's now flipped and is more than the other side once was less once was more somewhere in the middle it has to be exactly equal what's really important is i can do this up a dimension now i'm considering two points in its antipodes where they're allowed to be anywhere on the surface of the earth not just the equator and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out at any point on the surface of the Earth, which I will now call S2, two-dimensional, is I'm going to tell its temperature and its pressure. I'm going to give a two-dimensional output. That is, we can kind of imagine plotting from these points up into a plot of temperature and pressure, a two-dimensional output. Then the borschek uhlen theorem says that there exists some spot where that spot and its antipode had the exact same temperature and pressure. So the claim here is an existence claim. It says somewhere along that equator, there is a point that has the exact same temperature as its antipode. Now, I'm not gonna prove this theorem in this video, but I have a previous video that proves a related theorem to borschek uhlen using a delightful combinatorical proof. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Now let's return to the scenario of three objects in three dimensions, and we want to cut each of them exactly in half with a single plane. There's a nifty trick for dealing with directions in three dimensions that I want to show you. Let me consider a sphere centered at the origin. This is not one of our three objects, it's just going to be a reference sphere. If I put a point on the surface of the sphere, then this generates a notion of direction by considering the line through the origin and through the point on the surface of the sphere. Thus, any point on the surface of the sphere is associated with a line like this one. The reason I care about direction is that direction in three dimensions defines an orthogonal plane. Actually, it defines a family of orthogonal planes all up and down that line. Okay, back to the ham sandwich theorem. I have three objects. I want to slice all of them in half as well, and I'm going to put up my reference sphere at the origin. I'm actually going to color one of the three objects yellow because I'm going to focus on that one first. For any point on the surface of my reference sphere, I can use the same intermediate value theorem argument that we use for pancakes to say that I can move up and down that family of orthogonal planes until the first of the three objects is split exactly in half. And then this can be done for every direction on the reference sphere. As the point moves around the reference sphere, I can always move up and down that family of planes until I find at least one that's going to cut the first object in half. It's unlikely to cut the other objects in half, but it will always do the first one. Now let's look at the other two spheres. If I pick a side of the plane, for example, taking the direction from the origin out through the point as the positive direction, then consider the portion of the volume of these objects that is on the positive side of the plane. For instance, here the plane cuts the first object A1 in half by construction, it looks like a little bit of A2 is also on the positive side, but none of A3. So I want to use this notion of volume on the positive side of the plane to construct an explicit function. Okay, so let's summarize where we're at. We began with a point on the surface of the sphere. The point then generated this line out from the origin through the sphere. It was like telling me a direction. Given those directions, you got a family of parallel planes, and specifically, there was at least one of that family of plane that was cutting the first of the objects in half. Now what I'm going to do is construct a function. Is its input is p, that is, its input is a point on the surface of the sphere. But its output is something two-dimensional. That is, this is a plot from S2 to R2, from the sphere to the two-dimensional real space. And what it does is it just computes the volume of the second object that's on the positive side of the plane and the volume of the third object that's on the positive side of the plane. These are just numbers, some volumes. And so what I have is a map that goes from the sphere to two-dimensional real space. Its output has two coordinates. It's a continuous function. You wobble the p around a little bit. The plane doesn't change very much. It's continuous. And so borschek ulum applies. And thus it says there is some spot on the surface of the year, some direction, where this function evaluated at p is going to give the exact same result as this function evaluated at minus p. Let's think a bit more carefully about antipodal points p and negative p. The corresponding plane is actually exactly the same. They create the same line and thus the same plane, except 
The orientation has changed. Which side is considered positive has changed. Thus, changing from P to negative P is actually the same slice, but which side of the plane we think of as positive, that is the part that changes. So returning to our function and the application of borschek ulam that says there exists this point where f of p is f of minus p, but now because I know that the difference between p and minus p is the same plane just oriented in the reverse way, basically what I'm saying is that for each component, the volume on one side is equal to the volume on the other side. This was always true for the first object by construction, but now for the second and third objects by my function, the volume on one side is the volume on the other side. And thus, I found a plane by which I can cut three different objects precisely in half. But the ham sandwich theorem actually generalizes. Here I had three components living in three dimensions, but imagine you're living in n dimensions and you've got now an n component sandwich. Then the theorem still works. It says, you can find some n minus one dimensional hyperplane is the fancy way of doing it, where you can take your n minus one dimensional knife and slice along that n minus one dimensional hyperplane and cut all of the n components of your n dimensional sandwich exactly in half. That is a bit of a mouthful, but that is nevertheless the ham sandwich theorem. Now, if you want to learn more cool math, then I would highly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant has thousands of lessons in mathematics, science, and computer science, and what I really love about them is that their lessons are very well aligned with the science of how to learn effectively, which is something I talk a lot about on this channel. Their lessons are really interactive, where you as a student are in the driver's seat, whether that is playing with an animation or practicing a problem. Brilliant lessons really emphasize conceptual understanding, so you know why you're doing a computation and not just rote memorizing it for some test. And I think their courses are really well scaffolded, so complex ideas are broken down into easy to understand elements. Personally, as a mathematician, I've actually forgotten a lot of the physics that I once learned. And so I've been going through Brilliant's physics courses and I'm just really enjoying it. So to get started for free, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazit or click the link down in the description. And the first 200 people to use that link are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said, if you have any questions or thoughts about the video, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.